I'm Jane Butler, Director of Retail here at Google, specializing in e-commerce. Every day, I work with retailers like you to help acquire customers, drive sales, build brands, and foster loyalty. But wow, have our jobs gotten more challenging since COVID upended the world over a year ago. My family's life got upended in a good way when we decided to get a pandemic puppy last spring. We are first-time dog owners, and boy, did we have a lot to learn. Because of the pandemic, we turned online for everything, watching training videos on YouTube, discovering all the best chew toys, and even searching for the perfect name, Cassie. Along the way, we discovered new brands and leaned into new ways of shopping, like same-day delivery and curbside pickup. Here at Google, we're seeing stories like mine play out at scale across the hundreds of millions of people shopping across Google more than a billion times each day. We're seeing firsthand the notable changes in shoppers' behaviors. And as we look towards the future, we're all wondering the same thing. Which behaviors will remain as part of our new normal? To answer that, we spent time conducting research and digging into Google search data. And what we found is that we are never going back to the way things were. Here are four behaviors that are going to continue. First, like we saw in 2020, buying patterns will continue to be unpredictable as people react to change. We see this reflected on Google, where 15% of searches every day are brand new. Secondly, people will continue to seek and discover ideas and inspiration online, even when they aren't actively looking. We see this on our platforms, where 70% of shoppers surveyed said they bought from a brand after seeing it on YouTube. Thirdly, after trying new ways of shopping during the pandemic, people will continue to rely on and expect convenience. We see sustained increases in people checking inventory online, using store pickup options, and even searching for delivery on Sundays, traditionally a peak in-store shopping day. Finally, people will be discerning about how they spend their dollars, increasingly choosing brands that align with their values. For example, searches for things like black owned and ethical online shopping have surged in the past year. Alongside these consumer behavior shifts come industry growth. Retail was up almost 6% in 2020, the most growth in well over a decade. Now, much of this growth came from e-commerce, which was up 44% last year. In fact, across the biggest omni-channel retailers, no one grew overall sales without substantial growth in e-commerce. And this will continue. E-commerce and the role of digital in driving to stores will be critical for continued business growth. Now, while this brings undeniable opportunities, it also presents ongoing challenges for retailers. Knowing that there's no going back, I'd like to share three imperatives to be ready for what's next. First, be ready to act on unexpected consumer truths by being data and insights led. We all know that how and what people bought changed in the last year. Grocery moved online, and the move to remote work sparked an increase in sales of tops, but not bottoms. Consumer needs changed quickly. The businesses that had their data in order and could spot trends in real time were able to capture demand with new promotions, services, and categories. The Farmer's Dog, a direct-to-consumer dog food brand that focuses on freshly made food, one of Cassie's favorites, is a great example of this. Like me, more Americans adopted pets last year than ever before. This increase, coupled with their need to stay at home, caused a surge in demand for healthier, more convenient dog food delivery options. The Farmer's Dog leveraged real-time search trends to inform their content and non-branded search strategy to bring fresh, human-grade dog food straight to customer stores. Due to the surge in demand and their expansive Google search presence, the Farmer's Dog increased new customer acquisition by more than 240% in 2020. The second imperative is to be ready to reach people where they are by showing up at decision-making moments across the shopper journey. Today, people are always shopping, whether they're stumbling upon the latest beauty products they didn't know they needed, researching the best air fryer, or looking for the nearest store with dog food in stock. It's critical that retailers and their brand products, store, and inventory information show up in these moments. Let me share a great example of this. Last year, 
Leading omnichannel retailer Dick's Sporting Goods saw demand surge in golf, outdoor activities, home fitness, and active lifestyle categories. To capture this demand, they partnered with Google to reach new and returning customers on YouTube with their See You Out There campaign. They also accelerated their automation implementation to capture ever-changing search intent and launched curbside pickup in a matter of days. These efforts helped contribute to a record-breaking year for the company. They welcomed 8.5 million new customers to the business, saw a nearly 10% increase in same-store sales, and doubled their e-commerce sales. And the third imperative is this, be ready to turn customers into super fans by offering a differentiated, trusted experience. With the rapid shift to digital creating strong tailwinds for customer acquisition, it's a critical time for retailers to double down on loyalty and retention strategies. For some, this means highlighting what they stand for. For others, it's bringing some of the magic of the store online, like offering AR try-on or making in-store experts available in their apps. For all retailers, this means investing in first-party data so that you can deliver customized experiences in a privacy-safe way. A great example of this is flower and gift provider 1-800-Flowers. At the onset of the pandemic, 1-800-Flowers saw a huge increase in demand as people sought connections with their loved ones from afar. Using insights from Google, they revamped their cross-brand loyalty program to keep customers coming back, they started an online peer-to-peer -peer support community and launched virtual flower arranging classes. This focus on driving loyalty helped 1-800-Flowers report record revenue and profits in their recent fiscal quarter, with revenue up 45% year over year. Last year was a great accelerant for digital transformation. Whether you were prepared and able to pivot your business quickly, or still need to lay the groundwork, it's not too late. As this Chinese proverb so wisely states, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Next up, you'll hear directly from my colleague Sarah and William White, the CMO of Walmart, who will discuss how the world's largest retailer navigated the pandemic and what they're focused on for the future. Thanks, Jane. I'm Sarah Travis, Managing Director of Retail at Google, and today I'm joined by William White, the CMO of Walmart. William, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. So William, you started your role in May of 2020. I can't think of a more challenging time to start any role, let alone as the CMO of the largest retailer in the world. Tell me more about your role and what that was like. Sure, definitely a challenging time to start a new job. Uh, one, just given the nature of the pandemic that we were in, but two, of course, doing it remotely and most of the time from my basement. So it was, it was, it was a challenging time to join. I think that for me, the thing that I was dealing with was juggling a lot of different things. There was the one, you know, how do I listen and learn and understand the organization while at the same time really rolling up my sleeves to you know, do the things that needed to be done while we're in crisis mode. There was also the balance and the juggling of being clear and focused on priorities while also being really nimble and reactive to the things that were going on that, that we were dealing with. I got focused on a few things. One was looking at the team and making sure that we have the right capabilities, the right structure, and the right people. Uh, I was focused on the role of marketing and really ensuring that we had the right seat at the table to drive strategic decisions. There was a focus on investment, making sure that we were putting our investment in the right places and that we had the measurement to understand uh, the return on it. And then lastly, there were some real tactical things that were important to get out the door. Obviously, holiday, uh, the biggest time of year for us. Uh, but we, we also launched Walmart Plus, which was a huge initiative. And so getting that out the door um, you know, was a big priority as well. At Walmart, you've got what, the biggest customer base of any retailer globally. Uh, I like to think about it as probably the largest focus group of shoppers in the world. What were some of the immediate shifts you saw in the way consumers were behaving 
And you mentioned being nimble. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you were able to do that in such a large organization? The pandemic accelerated some behaviors that were already happening. And so there was, you know, a real increase in our e-commerce, um, you know, buying behavior. But customers were really looking for not just things that they wanted to have shipped, but pickup, delivery. We were really accelerating our capabilities in that to deliver the high demand that we were seeing. We still had people coming into the store, but they were coming less frequently. And when they were coming, it was a much bigger stock up. But we were also looking at other big systemic things for us in terms of Walmart had operated two apps and we combined those apps into one during this time, which I think was a challenging time, but an important one for our customers. We also began testing in-home delivery uh, in some markets, drone delivery in some markets. And the bottom line is I think that, you know, as we saw what was happening with the customer, um, we wanted to move things that we already had in the works faster uh, and get get those out to, to, our, to our customers to serve them in, in the ways that we felt they needed. And one of the really big things that you got done last year was the launch of Walmart Plus. What are, how do you think about loyalty and how does Walmart Plus fit into your overall strategy? You reference the size and the scope that is Walmart. So 91% of America shops at a Walmart. And for us, it is important to really be that first place and drive that, that first place wallet share and to bring people in for their needs. And once they're coming in for that, expanding the assortment, expanding the offering uh, into other categories, into other services, really focused on serving the customer and what are their needs. And I think that, you know, that's been something that Sam Walton really set as, as the foundation for the company. And so, you know, we're driving that service. I think in doing so, uh, Walmart Plus has been uh, a great program for us. I describe it as the best of the Walmart experience. And so the things that you love, we're able to do in a more personalized way. When you think about delivery, delivery from our stores, the scan and go shopping experience, which is a frictionless shopping experience, other benefits. The more our customers are engaged in Walmart Plus, the better we can serve them. And so I think ultimately it becomes a win-win for both of us. And I think over time, we will continue to expand the benefits of Walmart Plus uh, based on what our customer is looking for and how we can better serve them. Can you tell me a bit more about your partnership with Google? Absolutely. So I think one, you used an important word partnership. And when I think about where from where we've been to where we are now we've probably moved that relationship from one that was more transactional to one that is more of a partnership i think that we've also advanced the partnership um, on the brand equity side and we're doing things together that i think help to you know drive greater consideration for the walmart brand help build build our equity um, and i think those are meaningful things i think We've gotten more customer centric. We're leveraging Google Trends and insights um, to help us get sharper on who we're reaching um, and the best in the best ways to, to do that. So I've got one last question for you. Um, as a leader in the space, other retailers often look to Walmart for how you're thinking about the future. Can you tell me about what you're thinking about in the next year and beyond? Well, you know, as an organization, you know, we've always been focused on customer centricity. And I think that, you know, we're continuing to sharpen the pencil on what that means. And, you know, I think that we're also driving greater emotional storytelling in the things that we're doing. Those two things kind of come together, driving the brand purpose more in our work. And so it's not just about the what we sell, but a little bit more about the why and who we are. And I think we've started on a journey there that will continue to, you know, to go down. Another area I would point to is, you know, we've been pretty active in trying to shorten the distance between inspiration and purchase for our customers. When, you know, when, when, when inspiration strikes, when someone, you know, finds something or, or um, is inspired about a product, 
we want to be there to help clo close the transaction. And so we've made a number of advancements in our social commerce, in the social commerce space. We're going to continue to lean into that. The customer is there and we're trying to drive the innovation and drive, you know, the, you know, the, the industry there, if you will, um, to help meet the needs of the customer. Well, we look forward to seeing you continue to innovate in retail uh, and lead the charge. So thank you so much, William, for your time. Really enjoyed the conversation and look forward to seeing you soon. Next up, you'll hear from Sajal Kohli, senior partner at McKinsey. The basis of competition is gonna shift away from product superiority and price to privilege insights and experience. There's gonna be a big pivot away from building physical relationships to now digital relationships with your consumer. We also think from a global perspective, there's gonna be an era of reversal where intellectual property and latest practices are gonna move from the Eastern part of the world to the Western part of the world. Ecosystems will definitely take root and grow massively and very rapidly. And from a traditional retail standpoint, several assumptions will need to be challenged. For example, how do you reimagine the role of store? How should you leverage your assets in a B2B context versus just in a B2C context? The days of long range planning are over. We'll have to get used to much shorter horizons when it comes to planning. What comes with those short planning horizons will be nimbleness when it comes to pretty severe and dramatic resource reallocation. We think retailers will have to reallocate resources to the tune of 30 to 40% over the next three to five years. And maybe lastly, to embrace the fact that growth is gonna be granular. It's gonna come in very specific micro pockets and it'll have to be through automation and fueled by data and advanced analytics. The consumer landscape in APAC is actually quite instructive and there are three or four trends that we are seeing that we think will actually cut across the globe pretty quickly. The first is that the flight to digital is permanent. Even in a country like China, where there was a very high digital penetration amongst the consumer base, we've seen through the pandemic, things stabilize at a much higher watermark than pre-pandemic. The second thing we are seeing in APAC is this massive shock to loyalty. More consumers have come into and tried different brands, different channels. And so the premium on creating loyalty through your consumer base is gonna be even higher and tougher. Third is a big surge in O2O. We are seeing this gather some scale in, in Asia quite specifically, and we see it traveling West imminently. Fourth, early and green shoots in social commerce and community buying a whole new other way of engaging consumers. And maybe lastly, a little bit more entrenchment of the trend we saw pre-pandemic, which is hard discount, the club channel, e-commerce and marketplaces will be the winners. Imagine if stores are actually an experience center, not just a physical location where transactions happen. Imagine a physical location where every store has a curated assortment, so micro-merchandising versus one-size-fits-all. Think about technology enablement of customer service so you can delight the customer, so tech-enabling you know, tech services and customer service in a physical location versus just through human interaction. What could personalization in a physical location mean versus just having personalization online? How do you tap into workforce of the future? With the gig economy and omni-channel, do you really need full-time shifts? What should the different roles be in a physical location in this new world? And maybe lastly, could stores be an extra node from a fulfillment standpoint at a last delivery standpoint? So imagine a store that's a combination of being an experience center and a micro-fulfillment center at the same time. As we look forward, we think marketers will have five really important opportunities to galvanize around. First is multi-speed. You'll have to think about one hour cycles, monthly cycles, yearly cycles to live in a multi-speed environment. Second, really blending together in equal part, analytics and creativity. This is not gonna be a game of either or. You'll have to do both really well. The third 
is really putting purpose, the purpose of the brand and the retail establishment or organization at the center of everything that you do. It's this is not going to be enough to ask customers to buy your product. You'll have to give them a really compelling reason to go beyond the transaction. Fourth is integrator mindset. We really believe marketers will be at the epicenter of connecting the dots across multiple functions to serve the consumer holistically. And lastly, using data as the currency for full in journey insights and analytics, closed loop measurements, first party data is going to be critical.